Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. We had a dinner party last night. We discussed TED, and uh, everyone knew it's a great program, but most people don't know what TED stands for. So here is my interpretation of what TED is. is teaching the past, dreaming the future. And uh, if we talk about dreams, I'm not sure what I had to eat last night, but I had a very strange dream. I'm walking in the street, and here comes a guy holding two watermelons and smiling. And I look at him, and I say, hey, guy, I have a simple question for you. Do you know why there are 60 seconds in a minute? He looks at me, and he said, can you hold the watermelons for me, please? <laughs> so I'm holding the watermelons, and he looks at me, and he says, I don't know. <laughs> so I ask him, why are you smiling? He said, I'm smiling because I like simple questions, and I love watermelons. <laughs> OK, <laughs> smiling. When my son was in second grade, he asked me a simple question in mathematics. And I explained it to him. And uh, then when I was done, he looked at me and he said, Dad, when you were explaining to me the question, you were smiling all the time. Why did you smile? I said, because I love this stuff. It's a lot of fun. And I think we have to recognize that learning is an emotional process. Teaching is an emotional process. We need to fall in love with the material. How do we teach a smile? I believe we teach a smile by telling a story. We need to tell a story that we actually enjoy. We need to tell a story that we actually enjoy telling. Let me go back to this 60 seconds in a minute. Anyone knows why there are 60 seconds in a minute? It actually came from 4,000 years ago, the Babylonians. They were the first to invent a number system. It was base 60. And they wrote on clay tablets. And they had two symbols, one for one and one for 10. So in a sense, they had the binary system, because you don't want to write too many symbols on a clay tablet. And they had the decimal system, because they had the 1 and the 10. But at the end, they decided to go with the base 60, because they can compute more accurately their astro astronomical tables. So that sounds really complex. So I'll show you an example. So if you look at this number here, you see a single 1, you see four tens, and you see two ones. Who thinks that this number is bigger than 120? Anyone? Yes. Yes, I have one yes. So in fact, the way to think about this number is that it's one hour and 42 minutes. 142. 42 is a symbol base 60. And in fact, this number is 102. So it is 120 for someone dyslectic like myself, <laughs> but not in really. I always say the Babylonian knew everything. They thought they knew everything. This slide is dedicated to Pythagoras. Pythagoras, I apologize. The Babylonians knew your theorem a thousand years before you were born. <laughs> Not only did they knew your theorem, they were fascinated by different aspects of that. To remind you, in a right triangle, the sum of the red squares equal to the blue area. They like things that are integers. There was a reason for that, again, for computing. So one magical sequence is 3, 4, and 5, because 3 squared plus 4 squared equals 5 squared. Anyone can give me another magical triple? What? 5, 12, and 13. 5, 12, and that's amazing, because I thought you will say 9, 12, and 15, which is the uh, cheating, because you just multiplied by three, you're pretty good. 
I'll, I'll show you another one, 18, 8, 15, and 17. Now, what is your name? Carl Feynman. Carl Feynman. Nice meeting you. <laughs> Carl Feynman, can you give me a number, a triple, that all the three are bigger than 100? <laughs> Excellent. It's easy to multiply by a hundred. <laughs> this number appeared on the clay table, te tablets of the Babylonian. Amazing. Try to find a number of this magnitude. They actually knew how to do it. There is a method how to do it. And they knew everything, but then they got stuck. It's not nice to say that someone got stuck. And uh, my apologies to my mom if she's watching it. I'm, I'm trying to really behave. Is it true, Carl? I'm behaving? <laughs> okay. Uh, so why did they get stuck? They got stuck because when we look at, uh, at their tablets over a thousand years, it's more or less the same set of ideas. And uh, they were really good in doing the stuff they knew. So I thought maybe what we should look for in the tablets is some sign that they have also SAT exams. <laughs> I think they were very good in what they had, and instead of thinking about what they don't know, they were competing with each other about who knows better and how fast can you compute, and uh, how big is your car? No, they didn't have cars. <laughs> so, they got stuck for a thousand years. Then 2,000 years later, the Greek came, and the Greek actually figured out and wrote it down, this is Euclid and his friends, how to describe all those magical triples, all of them. And uh, in addition, and most importantly, they had the concept of a proof, which is a basis for our mathematical method. And using those proofs, we constructed the beautiful structure of mathematics. So, for example, revolutions. In uh, 300 years ago, Newton used mathematics in order to revolutionize physics. And we got the Industrial Revolution. 150 years ago, George Boole used mathematics in order to create formal logic, and that led to the information revolution. I don't like the word revolution. I think it's a word of the 20th century. People like revolutions. I think it's just a natural evolution of our knowledge. And we are just at the beginning. We are just at the beginning. Because uh, it's amazing that uh, 4,000 years ago we were writing on clay tablets, and now we can build chips with b one billion transistors. However, if you look around you, people still use tablets. People still use tablets. <laughs> and I have, I have a friend that is called Bobby. And he has a, a blue tablet. A blue tablet. And every time that I see him, he tells me, Shuki, I say, what? You cannot believe what are the new apps I have on my tablet. <laughs> I said, really? He said, look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. And I said, Bobby, where are you? <laughs> where are you? Do you know the joke, Bobby, of the guy with the two watermelons <laughs> that is uh, animated? He's checking. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, wow. But why is it funny? Bobby, I think you should get the app that tells you if a joke is funny or not. <laughs> okay, the challenge for the next 50 years. I think we need to go back to the basic. I think we need to teach people that it's fun. I think we need to teach people to ask simple questions. I think we need to focus on our collective ignorance and together try to think about new ideas. And I think we need to discover education, 
motivated by curiosity and natural passion. And I have the Caltech logo here. It's a special logo. You see one hand handing the fire to the other hand. The fire represents what you believe in, what you love. The fire can be your value system, your knowledge, your jokes, your lame jokes, <laughs> anything that you want to pass. And I have one request for you today. It, this is a homework for all of you. It's not uh, mandatory, of course, but go home and think about it over the weekend. The question is, you are holding the fire. You're holding the fire. Think what is the fire that you want to pass to the next generation? What is it? Thank you very much.